Samuel Langhorne Clemens, great American author and humorist. We, we know him as Mark Twain. Twain lived from 1835 to 1920. And he had this wonderful way of poking fun at life and even making us laugh at ourselves. One of my favorite Mark Twain quotes, he says that a cat that jumps on a hot stove will never jump on another one, but neither will it jump on a cold one. Now think about it, all right? It'll get you in a minute. He, he had this great wit, very direct with what he said. Twain once said, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant I could hardly stand to have him around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much he had learned in seven years. <laughs> Recently, I've had a quote from Twain that came across my way from several different sources. Uh, and, and it really has struck me. And here's what he said. He said, the two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. Now, I'm not sharing that with you because it's some great spiritual insight from Mark Twain, and I certainly don't intend to use it as the foundation for the message today. But, but there's much to be said uh, biblically, spiritually, about finding our purpose in life. And this morning I want to move from Twain's secular statement to sharing about that. Today I'm going to share with you from the perspective of uh, your pastor. Uh, as you know, this year our sermon emphasis is entitled Living the Cross. And many months ago I was going through and, and seeking the guidance of the Holy Spirit and laying out the schedule of the sermons for the whole year. And, and actually, the first sermon of 2015 was supposed to be the cross and your pastor. But the only problem was I got sick and I couldn't be here that day. And so I just moved to sermon number two and three and so forth. But in the last few days, it's just uh, been impressed upon me by the Holy Spirit that I needed to share that first sermon. And, and it's sort of a why am I here message. Now, I want you to know that today I'm going to talk about why I'm here. Next week I'm going to talk about why you are here. I would suggest you be here, all right? Um, you know, at the forefront of who we are uh, needs to be an awareness that we were created by God. I mean, every single one of us in here, best days, worst days, whatever it might be. I mean, we're God's creation, and we, are, we bear witness to his creative power. But we haven't been created merely to exist. God has placed within every one of his children a purpose. And scripture tells us that. And although there's a lot that can be shared and we can go get books and do all the searching and everything else, really our purpose in life can be reduced to one all-important statement. And this is it. We are created for God's glory. And we're going to share that. I mean, God pulled out, selected, elected the people of Israel. And the reason he did it was that through him he would show the world at that time that he existed and who he was and it would bring glory to himself. I mean, Jesus Christ came here, walked among humanity. You know, his, his prayer always was, I don't want to bring glory to my Father. In fact, when he bowed his knees prior to his arrest in the garden, first part of his prayer was this that what would happen to him would bring glory to his Father. And every follower of Jesus Christ walks in the command to live a life that points the way to God and brings him glory. And I'm convinced more than ever that we have to embrace that and live that every day. And during my preparation for today, I was reminded and had impressed upon me again by the Holy Spirit of the undeserved calling that God's placed on my life. Uh, to stand in this pulpit week after week and share the message he sends, to walk with the church family in good times and bad times, and to join together in growing in Christ-likeness and sharing and showing the gospel to others. And in the midst of that, God said, oh, by the way, this is what I've called you to do, and to live a life that reflects the cross. So make sure you do it. Being a pastor doesn't elevate someone above anybody else. 
It means that God has called out someone to shepherd his flock and to lead, preach, and teach them. And so this morning, I'm going to share about that and ask you to walk along with me in my calling. Uh, But before I do, let me share an observation. Occasionally, someone will come up after the service and they'll say, good sermon, good message, or whatever. And I appreciate that. It's an encouragement to me. And and usually what I'll say is, well, you know, that was for me. Doug Webster put it this way. He said, the best preachers are those who preach first to themselves and then to others. That makes me a great preacher. (laughs) But we should, because what Scripture tells us is that we're to lead by example. Now, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. And I want to share some verses there that I alluded to, at least in the little time with the children up front. But very important Verses both for those who have been called to pastor and as you look to the responsibilities and standards for the pastor. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 through 4, here's what it says. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion but willingly, not for dishonest gains but eagerly. Nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Now, when it comes to the standard that I believe God holds for every pastor, this is it. It's our, our modeling is Jesus Christ himself. And the standards for carrying out that model are found here. We're, we're going to look at some other ones, but particularly in 1 Peter chapter 5. And notice how verse 2 begins. It's, it begins with the example of the shepherd. That's what I was sharing with the children. Shepherd the flock of God. If you look at the English Standard Version, it says, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. And, and I like that word because it brings to mind an image that we're probably familiar with. If we were to ask in here, just give me the image that you would have of a shepherd Many of us would say, well, it, you know, it's a lone shepherd out on a hillside and his sheep are all around and he's watching over them. And when we do that, attention of the shepherd, if we look at it, is, is focused not on only one or select few, but all of the flock is important. And there's the message of protection and concern for all the flock. And, and God tells us here initially, pastors can't shepherd the flock from afar. And the days are busy, the demands are many, but the command is clear to take care of God's people. Now pay attention to what it says here. Three words, uh, in verse three rather, we find these words, but being examples to the flock. And that, that really hit home with me as God walked me through this. You know, pastors don't lead by driving, they lead by leading. And and I think back, as I've shared with you before, in my childhood and then in my adult life, we raised sheep. And uh, boy, when I look back, uh, I'm just amazed at the lessons that I've learned from them and how it relates to Scripture. And when it comes to leading, uh, there's a great lesson in sheep. If you've never tried to drive a flock of sheep, don't. Have you ever seen that commercial on TV where they're herding the cats? They could put sheep there. I mean, they just go. They don't know what to do. Well, I learned pretty early, you don't drive sheep. What you do is you go and find the dominant you in the flock, and you put a halter on her, and you start leading, and all you got to do is turn around, and all of them are right behind you, following her along. And that's how leading takes place, by one who, through example, and one who is sufficiently involved in the life of the flock, steps out and follows a godly pattern that others can follow. Now, I could stand here, folks, and tell you how far short I fall of that, from that, but it would take too long. And God didn't call me to do that today. Now, God didn't say, get up there and confess everything and walk out of here feeling worthless. God said, get up there and share what Scripture says about the pastor and be challenged to do a better job 
at what I've called you to do. And, I, and, and he said to me, and I said to myself, how could I stand here for 12 months and talk about living the cross and asking and imploring you to do it scripturally and practically if I didn't do it myself? And so, I, you know, I start, in 2015, my determination in my life is, is that it would totally reflect the cross. Now, I want to tell you this, for my, me and for every one of you, it's not simply a matter of saying, I'm in, it's going to happen. It's not like that. It takes effort, and it takes discipline. Ned Matthews is a seminary professor at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. Here's what he said. A preacher should expect that he will have to discipline himself in order to excel at developing Christ-likeness and in teaching sound doctrine. It will require daily and relentless practice, and he will have to work at it and stay with it. Let me tell you, one of the first things I learned when I became a pastor was that ordination certificate and that license to preach is not instant sanctification. John Wycliffe said there are two things necessary for the pastor, the holiness of the pastor and the wholesomeness of his teaching. Now, as I read that and, and walked through this, something really struck me that I want to share with you today. Because I, I hear this a lot about the life we live and how it's, a, you know, our testimony. And, and I got to tell you, you know, they've got these signs and things you can buy that says the best sermons are lived, not preached. Folks, if you got one on your wall, I hate to tell you that's a fallacy. That, that falls short of what God asked us to do. You see, the preacher's life, when godly in character confirms the gospel, it doesn't replace it. My life doesn't become a substitute for sharing the gospel and displaying the gospel in everything that I do. And I'm reminded that my call as your pastor is not simply to look back and see how much you've grown, but together for us to look and see how much we have grown together. And one of the ways that we do that is through preaching God's Word. Many years ago in my first church, I had a dear friend, a godly man named Buck Jordan. And, and Buck was faithful. He never missed just a I mean, what a great example he was. Every single, oh, I mean, and let me insert this. this. My first church was when I was a full-time judge, a seminary student, and, and a pastor. And so my days had three elements, courtroom, classroom, or study. So Saturday nights would come around, and I'd say, Lord, you've got to do something quick. I need a sermon. Now, let me just tell you, this is a confession. There's not one of those sermons you'll ever find in a textbook or an example of a great sermon, but somehow God used them. But Buck would come up to me after every single sermon, every time, and he'd say, good sermon, preacher. And it was a great encouragement to me. And, and one of the things I realized is Buck said that, and over the years, I mean, I've been called judge, doctor, reverend, brother, and some I can't say in church. <laughs> but if you ask me what's the greatest one, it'd be this preacher. To share God's word, to have that call on life, and to respond to it. And I'll confess to you that when I take my last breath, I'm still going to struggle with trying to understand how you balance pastoring and preaching. But... One is not more important than the other, but I've come to believe totally that the responsibility of standing in this place and proclaiming God's Word must never take second place to anything. If you still have your Bibles there, which I hope you do, turn to Acts chapter 10. I want to share a verse there. Now, let me set the scene for you a little bit before we read this verse. And it's verse 42, if you can't stand it and want to get ahead. Peter is preaching uh, to Cornelius' household. And he's sharing with them the gospel, but he starts back and talks about uh, John the Baptist, and he shares about Jesus, and he shares about uh, Jesus 
doing everything to the glory of God. And then he shares a command that Jesus gives in verse 42. And he says this, He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and of the dead. Jesus himself commanded that his life, his death, and his resurrection be preached to everyone. The one who died to reconcile us to God says, this is a top priority. Preach it. Share it with everyone. Now, at the end of the year, first of this year, necessity took me out of the pulpit. And Joshua filled in and, and did a great job. But I got to tell you, I miss being here. And I, I don't want you to understand, misunderstand what I'm saying. Not that I want to stand up here for 30 minutes or whatever and talk. And in fact, every time when I stand up to preach and I start up those steps, here's what's going through my mind. Why me, Lord? Is, there's this sense of humility and this sense of unworthiness that comes with that call. But there's also overpowering it this undeniable and unquenchable desire to share the Word of God. And Jeremiah experienced that. Listen to what he said. Jeremiah said, I'll not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. That's a huge part of living the cross for your pastor, and should be for every pastor who stands and leads a Christ-centered church. You see, it's not a matter of delivery style or voice inflection, tone or volume. It's an evident passion to boldly proclaim the Word of God without hesitation, reservation, or apology. And as I live the cross, I want to be consumed with the passion and unquenchable desire to share that. And I want every pastor and preacher who steps up to the pulpit in a Christ-centered church to feel the same way because it's based in God's Word. And it's not always what you find in preaching today. Sadly, there are those on one side who want to preach a diluted gospel and fill up pews and make people happy. On the other end are those who don't want us to preach at all, who want to silence the Word of God because they find it offensive, confrontational, which it is, are out of line with our culture. What the Bible says is that I'm to lead by example. That's my call. The command is to preach the gospel, and the charge is to teach. If you look over at 1 Timothy in chapter 4, First Timothy chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. These things command and teach. See, never to be omitted from the call to preach is a call to teach. And in many ways, teaching is a practical application that follows preaching. And we look at this, we see that there is a foundation that has to be in all teaching. Notice what it says, the Savior of all men. Every sermon, every lesson should have Jesus Christ as its focus. And I'll tell you this, folks, listen up. If you sit in a church that calls itself Christ-centered and listen to a message that does not focus upon Jesus Christ himself, or draw attention to him, you better check where you are. Because that's the focus. That's what brings us to this place. In this passage, Paul is instructing his young friend Timothy on the qualities necessary in the ministry. And one of those that he says is an absolute is teaching. And it's how sad today that rather than taking what God has given us and sharing it and teaching it, some choose to dilute it and make it appealing and easy to swallow. The command is clear and there's no room for ducking the responsibilities. 
Richard Baxter was a 17th century Puritan. And uh, I want to share something that he wrote. Here's what we have from him. The ministerial work must be carried on diligently and laboriously as being of such unspeakable consequence to ourselves and others. We're seeking to uphold the world, to save it from the curse of God, to perfect the creation, to attain the ends of Christ's death, to save ourselves and others from damnation, to overcome the devil and demolish his kingdom, to set up the kingdom of Christ, and to attain and help others to the kingdom of glory. And are these works to be done with a careless mind or a lazy hand? Oh, see then that this work is done with all your might. Study hard, for the well is deep and our brains are shallow. That's serious stuff. But, but let me tell you, let me illustrate to you how serious that is. Prior to Jesus' ascension, he appeared on the shore of the sea. And Peter and some of the other disciples are out in the boat. And, and they begin a conversation, and suddenly as they start coming in, Peter realizes who it is, jumps out of the boat, heads to shore. They share breakfast. In this all-important meeting in which anything could be talked about or focused upon, Jesus looks to Peter, and he says, Peter, do you love me? Three times. Here's what he told him. If you do, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. I believe with all my heart that is a pastoral directive. That he told Peter, you don't know what's waiting for you out there. The situations you're going to find yourselves in, the words that you're going to share, the preaching you're going to be called upon to do. But always remember this. Make sure you feed the lambs, tend the sheep, and feed the sheep. I never want to take it for granted or be less than what God calls me to be. Now, you may be sitting there saying, well, Pastor, what would you preach that sermon for? Well, I guess I needed it. What, what, I, what I've shared and what I've prepared serves as a reminder of the call that God's placed on my life and a challenge to live it out daily and a commitment to better live out the cross before each of you, and perhaps giving you a better understanding of my role as the pastor and what you not only should expect of me, but should I fall short in it, then you should admonish me. And I needed that. But, but listen up. You need it too. You see, every time we share from God's Word, in His unique divine way, through His Spirit, He takes that which is shared and applies it to the individual heart. I can't do that, you know. I don't know the diversity in here. I don't know the hearts in here. God knows every single one of them. And his spirit can take that which comes from the undeserving and unqualified lips of a human and transform it into that which touches the heart and change a life. And while I said that next week I'm going to be sharing about your call to live the cross, it's not something to be left to another day. Don't walk out of here thinking you got a week's reprieve. Because now's the time. And another quote that I came across recently was drawn to my attention by my son Peter. And one that has just stayed with me and, and uh, affected me as much as any in a long time. It came from John Piper. And I put it in my article last month in the Lifeline, but I want to share it again. Piper said this, that life is wasted if we do not grasp the glory of the cross and cherish it for the treasure that it is and cleave to it as the highest price of every pleasure and the deepest comfort in every pain. See, folks, it's not a matter of having a cross in the baptistry. It's not the matter of having a banner on the wall. It's all a matter of making a commitment to live out every single day what that cross of Jesus Christ truly, truly means. And the question that we face, all of us, is will we? Have we? You know, in our first service today, I said, this one's for me. 
two young people walk the aisle on professions of faith. You don't think God can't do it? You know, chances are if you pinned either one of them and said, what do you preach about today? They'd say, being saved. <laughs> you know, it wasn't about me. It wasn't about pastor. It was about what their heart needed. Right now in this place, let me tell you an absolute certainty. If you hadn't heard another word said today, I'll guarantee you this. Right now in this place, the Holy Spirit is touching your heart. Every one of us. Maybe somebody here for the first time realizes that they're separated from God and the Holy Spirit's convicted you of that separation and the sin that causes it. And the Holy Spirit's touched your heart and said, you know, the only way that you can right that is through a faith in Jesus Christ that recognizes him as the only son of God who died as an atonement, a sacrifice for your sins, was raised from the dead, and you're giving your life to him. For some of us, it may be where I am right now falls short of where God wants me to be. Lord, as I walk out of this place today, may I be ever aware through the spirit you placed in me that I need to grow and I need to be more Christ-like in everything I do. Let me pray with you and we're going to have our time of invitation. Father, as always, when we reach this time in our worship, it's a time again for deep reflection. It's a time to recognize not only that your spirit is at work, but he's speaking to each of us. It's a time to open our ears, listen to what he says, and then open our heart to what we're told to do. God, I pray right now, my heart, every heart here, that we're made acutely aware of that which you desire for our lives. What can we do to further bring you glory? And I thank you for every person here who comes not by chance, but comes by choice. I thank you for every single person who sits in that place and joins together to worship you. And now, as we have done that, you speak to us. Lord, it's with excitement that we reach this part of this service because you are at work, because you transform lives, because it brings you glory. We give it to you in your son's name. Amen. You stand, please.